So something a little different from us this time round. This is going to be a sort of podcast style uh, video. We stumbled across a building online which had seemingly been abandoned quite quickly. So the most recent inhabitants, it would appear, just vanish one day and all of their belongings were left and the house has been left to rot. Nobody seems to have claimed it, which is all just a bit odd. So it was intriguing enough for us to go and have a little explore, go and have a look and we've done that and in our next video we'll actually go into the building and you'll you'll um, you, you'll see the structure that's uh, that, that's left but the story for this podcast video is different it was only when we got back that we started to research the building to try and work out what what had happened to the most recent inhabitants that we found out the story of the brutal murder of Anne Wong. Now this is a quiet leafy village. Ribchester's a lovely place to visit uh, just on the outskirts of Longridge um, in Preston, Lancashire. You really wouldn't expect to hear of this sort of story in this sort of location but this abandoned building's got a story to tell. So the murder happened back in the Victorian era and it caused a local sensation and in fact a national one with the Times of London covering the story. Today the building lies abandoned, it's been left to rot but back in 1862 it was known as the Joiners Arms and was business premises and home to landlady Anne Wong. The Joiners Arms was a beer house before clean pipe water was widely available, water was drawn from the ground from wells, which often resulted in contaminated water spreading disease. So drinking beer, in which the germs couldn't live, was actually safer than water and was drunk even by quite small children. The government was also concerned about the levels of drunkenness resulting from excessive gin drinking, and they thought that this problem would be solved if people drank beer instead. So for a payment of just two guineas, anyone could set up business to brew and sell beer for consumption on their own premises. And this resulted in many small beer houses popping up, even in remote countryside locations, such as Anne Wong's premises. Anne was born Anne Edelston in nearby Chipping in 1783, and in 1807 she married James Wong, a widower. He was a husbandman or smallholder at Thornley, just the other side of Longridge Fell. She signed the marriage register with a cross for she was illiterate, which was not uncommon at that time. Behind their beer house they had a small holding of around nine acres of land on which they kept some milk cows and earned their living subsistence farming. James died in 1838 when Anne was just 55 years old, but she continued to run the beer house and work the land. Her son and daughter lived locally. The area around the beer house and her home was set in beautiful countryside but it was very remote. Her only close neighbours were those inhabiting the local workhouse. So if you think back to the days of Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist you'll see what those were like. They were openly labelled as being for lunatic paupers. And in 1862, the year of Anne's murder, the labour master there was a gentleman called Joseph Ward. We'll hear from him in a minute. Anne was described at the time as being thrifty and economical, but the local widespread belief was that she'd hoarded and hidden a large sum of money somewhere in the house. And in mid-November 1862, her rent was due, and she'd just sold a cow to provide the necessary money, and it was believed that she'd hidden that money as well. One of the frequent callers at the beer house was Duncan MacPhail, aged 34. He'd not had a bad start in life. His father had been a minister in the Baptist chapel in Huncote, near Padium, relatively nearby. But MacPhail himself had amassed numerous con uh, convictions for theft and fraud, and later for perjury, for which he was sentenced to be transported to Australia for seven years. But after a few years, he gained a ticket of leave and returned to Blackburn, where he set himself up as a traveller, or hawker, going round local villages in his horse and cart, selling cheese, bacon and green groceries. One of his customers was Anne Wong, and during one of his visits to Ribchester, he heard the rumours of her hidden wealth. The weather on the fateful evening of the 10th of November 
1862 was horrible. It was sleeting and snowing in this very remote location. Her neighbour from the workhouse, Joseph Ward, who we mentioned earlier, came round at 8pm, as he always did, to milk the cows and to close her shutters. When he left, all was in order. Apart from the weather, it was just another normal evening. However, when Joseph visited the premises between 6 and 7am the following morning, he was surprised to see that the, sh the shutters were still closed and there was no evidence of light or movement within the house. He went to check that Anne was okay, but found an obstruction behind the front door, preventing it from being opened, and a removed window frame around the back of the house. It had been prized out of the wall. Concerned and perhaps a little frightened himself, he went to seek help. William Pye lived in a nearby farmhouse, and the two of them went back to the house, gaining entry through the removed window. Upon shouting for Anne, they heard no reply, so they climbed the stairs and entered her bedroom. The sight that met them was horrific. Poor Anne, 79 remember, was tied to her bed frame, blood all around her head. She was cold and lifeless. One of them went to the police house in the village to alert Sergeant Whiteside, the other went to tell her son. Sergeant Whiteside described the scene that greeted the two unfortunate men. Anne was lying on her back, her wrists tied to the bed. Her bedclothes were all tangled and thrown about. Her face was covered by a woollen shawl, presumably to prevent her from recognising her assailants. Two handkerchiefs were tied tightly around her mouth, holding in place a gag to prevent her from calling for help. Interestingly, the sergeant noticed that her clock had stopped at 17 minutes past two, his theory being that one of the intruders might have searched inside the case to see if her money was hidden in there and had managed to disturb the pendulum. Whiteside returned to the police house and telegraphed to the main police stations in Preston and Blackburn for help. The superintendents from both towns rode immediately to the scene, for this was a time before cars, of course. Dr Patchett, the village physician, happened to pass by and was therefore the first medical professional to examine Anne's body but the actual post-mortem examination was conducted by a surgeon from Blackburn by the name of Dr William Martland. Dr Martland reported that she'd sustained at least two heavy blows to the face. One had caused a lacerated wound and a swelling to her eye, and the other blow had broken her nose. These blows did not kill her though. That fate was sealed by way of suffocation from the gag which had been forced into her mouth and held in place by a shawl wound around her head. A brutal attack on an elderly lady for nothing more than greed. Anne Wong was subsequently buried at Chipping beside her husband and her grave was likely to be marked by nothing more than a modest wooden cross and in modern days can now not be traced. Very shortly after her death, her family organised a sale of her goods and chattels held at the beer house itself. The sale of goods in this way, and this quickly after her death, was fairly normal for the time. Amongst those attending the sale was Duncan MacPhail, the priest's son come hawker. He had the audacity to issue Anne's son John with an outstanding bill for bread and cheese. John, although stunned by MacPhail's lack of taste, nevertheless had other things on his mind and duly paid up. Unfortunately, at this early point, the police didn't have much evidence to work with. Superintendent McNabb noted that there were four different pairs of boot marks in the snow around the beer house, but that the markings left weren't distinctive enough to identify who they belonged to. But the close proximity of the workhouse was an obvious place to start to look. One of the workers told Sergeant Whitehouse that another inmate by the name of Thomas Davis had visited the beer house the day before, seeking work. Unfortunately, the meeting hadn't gone well, and Anne had sent him away with some uncivil words. Perhaps he may, therefore, have borne her a grudge. Another inmate, Hugh Harrison, came forward to give further information. 
It later transpired that his account was full of lies, but he reported that Davis had often spoken of Anne's hidden money, which he said she'd hidden in her clock. He said that Davis had told him that he intended to rob her. Davis was described at the time as a careless, idle fellow of a somewhat suspicious character. The sergeant also thought that Davis's footwear might have matched the footprints left behind the beer house. With little else to go on, he was arrested and held in custody in the village police house. He vigorously protested his innocence right from the start, but the police seemed confident that they had their man. Davis's inquest, though, was adjourned several times as further information started to come to light. Now uncertain of their position, the police offered a reward of £100 to anyone giving information that led to the arrest and conviction of those responsible. £100 was a vast sum of money back then, upwards of £100,000 in today's terms, and the reward was widely advertised. This caught the attention of Thomas Bowling, aka Chorley Tom, from Salmsbury, who claimed to be a gamekeeper, but was in fact a well-known poacher. Thomas had many convictions for a series of smaller offences, but had also been previously acquitted of maliciously shooting a man. He went to the police at Blackburn to give his information and to claim his reward. He claimed that he'd visited Duncan MacPhail, the hawker, at his house in Blackburn, where MacPhail had admitted, boasted even, that he'd gone to the beer house with others, who he named Daniel Carr, Benjamin Hartley, George Woods and his brother William Woods. When pressed though, Thomas couldn't explain why MacPhail would have given him such incriminating information. The police didn't believe Thomas's whole story either, instead believing that Thomas himself had played an active role in the crime and was perhaps now looking to incriminate the other parties because he never got paid for his role. Nevertheless, all the parties named by Thomas were arrested and brought before the Blackburn Magistrate. When challenged at the trial that he'd simply lied in order to claim the huge reward, he said that he'd only come forward so that Tom Davis, who he knew to be innocent, might be released. Davis, who'd been kept in custody all the while, was duly released. Angry that he'd been held for such a long time, he demanded compensation. His claim was rejected, though, on the basis that there were reasonable grounds to su suspect him in the first place, and, well, in the days before legal aid, what was he going to do about it anyway? Going back to Tom Bowling though, the poacher, and in his statement, one of the arrested parties was a 53-year-old steam loom weaver named Benjamin Hartley. Benjamin told police that if they dropped any charges against him, he, he would give evidence against the others. Back in the day, this was called an approver. An approver was a person who'd participated in a crime, but who agreed to give evidence against their accomplices in return for their own freedom. In the days before DNA evidence and CCTV cameras, an approver's evidence could be very useful in gaining convictions. Hartley delivered his piece. He said that MacPhail came to his house one night and that he was fast for money. MacPhail told him of Anne Wong's hidden wealth and that she'd recently sold a cow so that she could pay the rent and MacPhail asked him to join and burgle the premises. He said that the plan was only to break in and to steal, not to harm Anne in any way. Now you can understand why MacPhail may have wanted an accomplice, after all Anne would recognise his face instantly, but to recruit a team of four other people suggests that the true plan wasn't a simple burglary. To add weight to that point, Hartley said that Carr and Woods armed themselves with crowbars and cudgels weighed with lead. MacPhail himself had a pistol and a dark lantern which had a shutter to douse the light. Hartley claimed that he went unarmed, but the fact that they turned, turned up as a heavily armed gang would suggest that they went intending serious violence towards Anne, either to ensure that she didn't survive the ordeal to recognise and name her assailants, or to beat out of her the location of her hidden wealth. The gang had two false starts to the crime, once due to the bright moonlight, and then secondly due to Woods turning up drunk. 
they all agreed to go the very next night, being the 10th of November, whatever happened. So that night they walked the seven miles from Blackburn to Ribchester and Hartley recalled meeting an old man nearby and exchanging comments about the foul weather as it had been snowing. Upon entering the village they hid in a barn where they could shelter from the snow and drink rum, waiting for the right time to pounce. At 2am they were confident that Anne would be in bed so they crossed the field at the back of the house and forced the window to gain entry. Hartley said that MacPhail and Woods, and I quote, plundered downstairs. One of them looked inside the clock, stopping the pendulum, just as Sergeant Whiteside had originally thought. Hartley, meanwhile, went upstairs with Daniel Carr. Now what happened next depends on who you asked. This is Daniel Carr's version. Mrs. Wallen woke up, saw us and screamed as Hartley held her down. I struck her with my loaded cane to quieten her, but in the process I hit Hartley, injuring his hand. He cried out, Oh dear, what art thou for? Now after his arrest, the police surgeon examined Hartley's hand, and he did indeed have a swelling to his hand, as if caused by a blow. Carr's next blow hit her on the head. She shouted out that he had killed her. Hartley's version of events differed slightly. Having heard all the noise upstairs, George Woods came up and despite her obvious injuries, told them to tie her to the bedstead, which they did. He asked her where the money was, but according to Hartley, she did not answer. According to him, Woods later said that he'd found the money, but he did not know where he'd found it, or indeed how he found it. They then left the house and headed towards Preston. On the way they discarded some of the weapons and the crowbar that they used to pry open the window. Wood said that he'd found 15 gold sovereigns and another three pounds in silver. They shared out the spoils, Hartley claiming that his share was a little over four pounds, the money wrapped in a piece of flannel. In his evidence to the magistrates, Hartley did not mention William Woods at all, who was discharged by the magistrate, and I quote, without a stain on his character. Hartley subsequently showed the police where they'd thrown away the crowbar and the canes, all of which were subsequently recovered, which supported his version of events. Superintendent McNabb noticed fresh footprints in the mud near the scene and ingeniously placed slates over them to protect them before an ornamental moulder from Preston could take plaster mouldings of the marks. These were then compared to the boots recovered from those people arrested. And these were the days before mass-produced footwear, so each boot would have cobblers, nails and the like placed in random locations. They matched Carr's boots to the prints. When the discarded rum bottles, drunk from sheltering from the snow, were found, Hartley's evidence looked very strong indeed. The Inquisition concluded that Duncan MacPhail, Daniel Carr, George Woods and Benjamin Hartley, not having the fear of God before their eyes, but being moved and seduced by the instigation of the devil, with force and arms, did, felonously, willfully, and out of their malice afterthought, kill and murder Anne Wallen. Upon this evidence, they were all sent for trial in Liverpool on the capital charge of willful murder. As they were led through the streets to the station to be taken to Kirkdale Prison in Liverpool, they were severely taunted and indeed threatened by a large crowd. In these pre-woke days, the press were free to say whatever they wished of the prisoners and describe them however they liked. The Blackburn Standard reported that they were glad that the inhuman savages who so foully murdered an unoffending old lady are in a fair way to being brought to justice. The Preston Chronicle said that MacPhail himself had a bad character which did not excite public sympathy and that there was something particularly sinister in his appearance. The Blackburn Chronicle wrote that 
he bore a bad character plagued with dishonest propensities. Bill Carr, aged 35, had a previous conviction for manslaughter and had served four years for a burglary in Longridge. The report said that his countenance had the harassed and vitiated look of a hard and badly used life. Woods, aged 45 on the other hand, was described as a well-made man, a joiner by trade. He'd even served as a soldier fighting in the Crimean War and in India and on discharge, his conduct was said to be straightforward and honourable. The trial took place on the 30th of March, 1863, in St George's Hall in Liverpool, which still stands today. Even before proceedings started, though, there was drama. When the prison wardens went to collect Daniel Carr from his cell to take him to the court, they found him dead. Initial thoughts were suicide, but the coroner certified his death as being asthma, disease of the heart and depression of mind and body. Victorian prisons were notoriously unhealthy places after all. His death didn't delay things though, and the trial of MacPhail and Woods continued. In 1862, residential burglary was a felony, and anyone who knowingly joined others to commit such a felony, which resulted in the death of the householder, was guilty of murder, whether they struck the fatal blow or not. Now remember that this happened over 150 years ago, and in those days, prisoners could not give evidence on their own behalf, the theory being that given that they are prisoners, they clearly cannot be trusted to tell the truth. So the trial went ahead without them giving any direct evidence, their lawyers instead having to work with statements of good character and the like. In total, the trial had taken 10 hours, which was very long by the standards of the day. The jury were out for just an hour, and then with what was described as a dejected and sorrowful countenance, the foreman of the jury pronounced verdicts of guilty upon both men. The crier called for silence which, as the reports have it, created a great effect upon the bystanders. Mr Baron Martin passed sentence, stating that they had been convicted of a most dreadful and barbarous murder, with what he described as the most conclusive evidence. He then placed the black cap upon his head and passed sentence of death. Newspaper reports say that the turnkeys had to support MacPhail to prevent him from falling to the ground. Records show that they were to be severely hanged by the neck until they be dead, and their bodies to be buried within the precincts of the prison in which they shall respectively be last confined after their respective convictions. The prisoners were taken back to Kirkdale Prison to be kept in the condemned cell pending execution of the sentence of the court. The very next day, the prosecution formally offered no evidence against Hartley, as was the deal that he struck with them as an approver, and he was officially acquitted. When he got home, though, to his house in Pearson Street in Blackburn, the locals had dished out their own justice. The house was heavily graffitied, proclaiming that this was the house of Hartley the murderer. And a hostile crowd had gathered, and he faced, and I quote, unmistakable manifestations of abhorrence. He left town immediately and never returned, thought instead to have emigrated with his wife. Both Woods and MacPhail tried to seek a reprieve to overturn the sentence. Woods attracted rather more sympathy than MacPhail, but the Home Secretary, Sir George Grey, wasn't having any of it. He stated that he could see no grounds on which to advise Her Majesty to interfere with the course of the law. In this era, executions were carried out in public, a hot topic back then and subject of much debate. Charles Dickens had witnessed a double hanging of husband and wife, after which he wrote the words, A gathering of thieves, prostitutes, ruffians and vagabonds, who'd flocked, exhibiting every variety of offence and foul behaviour, and who were inexpressibly odious in their brutal mirth and callousness. He was, he said, appalled at the ghastly scene. 
The execution of MacPhail and Woods was set for 12 noon on Saturday the 25th of April. William Colcroft was appointed to do the deed, an executioner for 45 years between 1829 and 1874. He was said to have executed 450 people. The scaffold was erected just outside the prison and during the morning the crowd began to gather and swell. Special trains were put on and over 1,000 people made the trip from Blackburn to watch the event. Reports stated that the greater part of these excursionists were well dressed, however others were quoted as evidently belonged to the lower orders of society. The behaviour of some of the younger men was anything but credible. The foul expressions used and the levity displayed were perfectly disgraceful. Later came streams of working men, dirty and ragged women and bare-headed and bare-footed children to witness the revolting and demeaning spectacle. In all, there were upwards of 30,000 spectators controlled by over 100 police. The execution itself was over in a few minutes. The prisoners came out from a gate in the prison. They were hooded, restrained, and then the deadly moment came. The crowd watched in silence and dispersed without disorder. Macphail and Woods were quickly buried inside the prison grounds. When interviewed later, Judge Mr Baron Martin was asked whether the prospect of condemning the accused to the death penalty could cause juries to hesitate. His response was very clear and concise. I have never had the slightest difficulty in getting juries to find the proper verdict. So that's the story, the sad story of Anne Wallen's murder and in our next video we actually end up inside the house. As I say, we didn't know that the murder had happened when we visited the premises. Our interest in the building was the fact that the more recent inhabitants of the building had simply vanished and left all of their belongings and that the house hadn't been claimed. But it was only when we subsequently looked into the research that we found out about Anne Wong's story. So, yeah, in our next video, we're going to go into what was the beer house. So we really hope you enjoyed that little explore with us and if you did uh, and you haven't already then please do subscribe. Um, it would also be great if you could hit the thumbs up, the like button. As a brand new channel it's not easy, it really isn't easy getting a new channel off the ground and we think that the YouTube algorithm, uh, algorithm will be watching and we want to get a good report card so the sooner we get some good traction and some positive feedback and thumbs ups and subscribers and messages and interaction we uh, yeah the algorithm can pick us up and hopefully uh, hopefully help us on our way and if you liked it enough to share it with friends and family that would be fantastic too so looking forward to seeing you on the next one